uh, pardon the mess, I'm in the process of moving right now. Do you remember that old bedroom I used to record in? They jacked the price up on that like 50% overnight. It was ridiculous. Uh, we found this really cool house. It's got a spooky garage in the back I want to do something with. It's, it's neat. Just a little life update. It's a mess, but that's not why we're here. We're here to talk about spooky things. It is officially spooky season. And today that will be a spooky song that I have been a fan of for the past few years and I think it's spectacular. I think it does a lot of really interesting production choices. Essentially what's going to happen is I'm going to play a little bit. We're going to roll over in real time a lot of the production choices I think make the song special. I'm going to get copyright struck, claimed. This video is going to get demonetized. I'm going to make no money on this. This is just like out of the passion of my own heart, trying to enrich your life. This is a selfless endeavor. I do have this song in a playlist down below. If you want to listen to it after the video, just keep that in mind. The song in question is called We Know Where You Sleep by The Paper Chase. They were a band from 1998 all the way up until 2010. They were founded by one John Congleton. Is that how you say it? Yeah, John Congleton. He is a phenomenal producer now and he's worked with like every band I've ever listened to. Folks like Phoebe Bridgers, AJJ, Shoo Shoo, The Mountain Goats, Death Cab for Cutie, St. Vincent, Lucy Dacus, The Killers. He's good, he's really good. And The Paper Chase is a crazy freaky band. We Know Where You Sleep is a crazy freaky song. It is like this descent into madness. It's a vicious evil evening with some malicious figure that is just out to hurt you. The lyrics are scary. The song kind of plays with your expectations a bit. The song plays with dissonance in a way that's kind of uncomfortable at times. It even alludes to some semblance of hope only to take it away from you at the last second. This is like a really mean-spirited song. They don't putz around. The song starts like this. Like that's just straight out of a Goosebumps book, right? The imagery created with just the instrumental alone is phenomenal. It leaves absolutely no room in your brain for anything other than what the songwriter and producer was intending. It is evil and oppressive. And it's only been like 10 seconds too. The coolest thing about this segment, in my opinion, are like the scissors. I have never heard scissors used in like a percussive manner like this. Like they're going off in the background, they're kind of playing with the uh, the stereo signal. So like there's scissors over here, there's scissors over here, there's like little sharp things coming to get you. It's a nasty, evil, cool idea. And they double down on the scissors right here too. And then the vocals come in. I've got you now. The chair lets you dangle slow in the back of the bus, all of us like the coats and cloak rooms. So you got these lyrics revolving around like a nasty dude figure thing. He's got you. He is exerting his will over you. You're trapped. You are his plaything. And bro has some spooky friends too. And if you rise again, take a form I know. The river will boil and overflow. And the house is your haunt and will tremble with temporal who do. Now we got a cult vibes. What is being done to the subject, the listener, is ritualistic in nature. You can't rise again without being knocked down initially. So he's going to knock you down. He's going to take you down in some semblance, whatever that means. I don't think that bro has the best of intentions. Not only is the singer violating the listener's bodily autonomy, uh, consent, freedom, to life. He's also proposing that he's gonna be controlling the outcome and logistics of their afterlife too, to a certain degree. Like he has you inside and out under his will. And then you have like this grandiose, kind of nasty pre-chorus right here. And close your eyes when we kiss. And then they hit you with the giant chorus. God, there's a lot to unpack here. So there is tons of imagery of like this father figure, authority figure, denigrating and abusing the subject. 
not only whittling away at their body, but also their spirit, their sense of self-worth. But this song clearly is not about like a father and child situation, like the last pre-chorus wipe that out of the realm of possibility, at least I hope so. It's about somebody in a higher position of power abusing somebody below them, making them believe that they are below them. I don't know, you take these themes about control and will and consent and then you kind of pair them with the nasty like kiss and stuff from previously, it kind of paints this really ugly, nasty, image if you're kind of picking up what I'm laying down here. You get a fuller picture of what's happening and it's terrifying and it's gross in real world scenarios. The song then deconstructs itself. It breaks in these ugly dissonant hits and chords and then it like transitions into the next verse. Then the lyrics come in and they show you how this person has infected the subject's life and world, even the places that they are supposed to be safe in and comfortable, those are stolen away by them. Any sense of peace and happiness has just been robbed and stolen from the subject. When your coffee bed We hit the pre-chorus and then we discover this new sense of determination and drive. As if the singer feels like they are being beckoned by some higher power, being absolved of their sins by something more grandiose than just humans. I don't know about you, but I am at peace, I know what it is that I must do. I hope you're sitting Then we hit the chorus again. It's pretty much the same, except the scissors are back and they're angrier. Then you just start chanting. It's huge. It's climactic. It's a little bit sorrowful, but also like scarily confident. I don't like the self-assuredness in the delivery of these lines. Given how dissonant and ugly the song can be, this huge moment of a more straightforward chord progression is beautiful and immense, and it's almost a semblance of relief for the listener right here. It is powerful and climactic and gorgeous. This is the climax of the song right here. Almost like you, the listener, are being granted some brief moment of levity. Like the listener is being coaxed into folding and kind of giving in to the song's will in and of itself. Is that making any sense? Like it's been ugly up until now and then as soon as they give you something pretty to latch on to, it becomes that much prettier, but it's easy to forget just how ugly the song has been up until now. The song has broken you down into accepting its form of manipulation from the perspective of the singer songwriter. It's brilliant. It's like this meta the folding where you have now become the subject of the song just through the songwriting structure alone. And then it falls apart around you and it's just this ugly, nasty, sad, oddly pretty ruin. We Know Where You Sleep is a sad, scary, oppressive song that is simultaneously heinous and dirty and evil, but it's also really hypnotic. Much like its subject matter, it beats you down into submission. It forces its will over you. And eventually you just kind of bend and break and accept it and roll with it. Like how clever and brilliant is that? It is a horrific masterpiece in my opinion. I love it. Also the cover art just really drives this home. I can't show it because it's got like this bro's cheeks out full force. His butt is just right there. Yeah, if you want more spooky songs, I got a little playlist in the description again. Uh, happy spooky season. I'll see you real soon.